Hello, this is Chris Safarova. Welcome to another episode of the Strategy Skills Podcast. Our podcast sponsor today is strategytraining.com. If you want to strengthen your strategy skills, you can get the overall approach used in well-managed strategy studies. It is a free download. Go to firmsconsulting.com forward slash overall approach. And if you're currently preparing for interviews and you want to get a better role for yourself and you're editing your resume, you can benefit from another free gift I have for you. It is a McKinsey and BCG winning resume, basically a resume that got offers from both firms. And you can get it. It is a free download. Go to firmsconsulting.com forward slash resume PDF. And Firms Consulting is, of course, F-I-R-M-S consulting.com. And today we are speaking with Charan Ranganath. Charan is a professor of psychology and neuroscience and director of the Dynamic Memory Lab, such a cool name, at the University of California at Davis, who for over 25 years, that's a very long time, has studied the mechanisms in the brain that allow us to remember past events, something that we want to be better at. And I'm so excited to have this discussion with you, Charan, because we don't spend enough time thinking about memory as leaders, but we need to understand better how we can leverage it to be more impactful, more successful, and also to be better leaders for our teams and for other areas where we are leaders, for example, at home, for our community, and so on. So welcome. So great to have you with us. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Charan, so before we started, we were making jokes about your band, Pavlov's Dogs. So let's start there. I think that no one can miss it. Whoever is watching now the video version of the podcast, which is on YouTube, go to Firms Consulting channel. You can get it there. And you can see all the beautiful guitars in the background, something you never expect to see when you're speaking to a professor of psychology and neuroscience who have been doing it for 25 years. So let's start there. Why Pavlov's Dogs? Was it difficult for you guys to even settle on this name? Yes, it was. And I might not have chosen the name to be fully, <laughs> full disclosure. Uh, but the idea is, is that many of the people in the band study learning and memory. And uh, as you may know, Ivan Pavlov was uh, one of the major, major figures in the study of learning and uh, part of a long tradition of Russian neuroscience. So. Uh, so that's that's where the name came from. The idea is, is that we're neuroscientists, we study learning, and so it seemed like a good name. And I love that you pronounce his name correctly, Ivan <laughs> Pavlov. This is very, very rare. I can probably count it on one hand over 20 years after I left Russia of people pronouncing Russian names correctly. It's even easier sometimes for me to pronounce it incorrectly. So we don't waste time trying to have a discussion about why am I pronouncing it in a weird way. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. I, I feel that way sometimes about my name too. <laughs> yes, and you have a, such a beautiful name. Oh, thank you. So let's dive in. There's so much to discuss and you you have this wealth of information about memory and most people have very, very limited amount of it. And most people don't even have the key things they need to know so that they can make sure that their brain functions well and they are protecting it for the future and that they're using memory correctly to fully benefit from it. So where do you think we should start? I think uh, we should probably start with just getting people's expectations of what memory is supposed to be. Let's start there. Let's so, <clears throat> you know, when I was asked, uh, when I was contacted about writing a book, uh, one of the ideas was to write a book to help improve people's memories. And I felt like many books have been written about that subject. They're very good books. But what I wanted to write is actually a book about not how to improve your memory, but how to think about memory as the way it was intended and how to use the abilities that you currently have more effectively rather than trying to improve people's abilities. And so what I mean by that is, you know, we all kick ourselves for forgetting and we all have this, or many of us do. Some people, small number of people I meet have like a very high sense of their memory, but for the most part, people complain about it to me. And when they complain, they're basing that on the expectation that they should remember everything all the time and have it at their fingertips whenever they need it. And that's just not true. There's no one who remembers everything. Um, there are some uh, famous people who remember a lot. Actually, one Russian uh, uh, 
uh, mnemonicist, or he was a mnemonist, is what they would say. And his name is Chadashevsky. And he was, uh, he had an extraordinary ability to remember things. Uh, but he didn't remember everything. And the things that, and he even his exceptional memory abilities didn't help him. He was actually tortured by his memories and uh, may have contributed to him basically drinking himself to death. So we don't necessarily want to remember everything. It's not necessarily a good thing anyway. And so I think a lot of people, one of the biggest problems we have is not our memory, but our expectations of how much we're supposed to remember and what it's there for in the first place. That is such a good example you shared with us. Sometimes we wish to have something, but we don't understand the price that it comes with. And are we willing to pay? Do we actually want to pay that price? That's exactly right. And this is something, you know, we've been doing computer models of the brain in our lab lately to try to understand more about how memory works in the brain. And in the process, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is design issues. And basically, from an engineering perspective, you think about choices that you're always making and trade-offs. So for instance, if I'm designing a car or if I'm designing a motor vehicle, I need to know, am I designing something to haul around as much stuff as possible? In which case I would design a truck that moves slowly, but has lots of cargo space, right? But if I'm trying to design uh, something that goes very quickly from one place to another and is very agile and has very tight handling, I will have to sacrifice the ability to carry a bunch of stuff, but I'll design a car that has very high performance. And I think our brains are much more the high performance sports car than they are this big cargo truck that lugs along. Um, and that's basically the trade-off that we have is you either carry a lot of memories with you in which case you're not going to be able to access what you want when you need it or you have a more nimble brain that basically takes a little bit but makes the most of it with all the things now happening with developments in technology ai and so on what can you share with us you have so much expertise in terms of in which areas when it comes to memory humans are superior and how we can use our memory to set ourselves apart from what a machine can do yeah. So you can look at right now, the pace of artificial intelligence has been going so quickly that it's, you know, people, it's very natural to be excited about this and say, oh, the computers are getting smarter than us. But realistically speaking, if I'm looking at something like, say, ChatGPT or, you know, Dolly, which is the uh, generative AI for visual images, they are fed actual images or actual stories and massive, massive quantities of data, more than we could possibly think of. And what happens is, is that they're actually sampling the world in a very different way than humans do. So I might feel like I have a photographic memory, but my actual perception of the world is not even photographic. So basically, as we're talking, you might be just unknowingly, especially when we first started talking, your eyes might be moving around, you know, let's say four times per second. And you're assembling a mental picture of what's going on from little bits where you land your eyes. And at those points where you land your eyes, you have very strong information about what's coming in. But the rest is kind of more blurry. And it's something that you often fill in those blanks with memory. So right off the bat, we're doing something different because if I feed in an entire like book into chat GPT, or if I feed in a, you know, photograph into Dali, we're not processing the world the same way as they are. So how does that make us smarter? Well, one thing we know is, is that people can learn a great deal from very little data. Sometimes that's a problem. Sometimes we overgeneralize from learning a few things. But what's really amazing about the human brain is we go for a quality over quantity. And so as a result, we can remember, let's say, one experience. And it's not like an experience that's based on the entire internet. It's one lived experience, let's say, that you had randomly with somebody that you might have been sitting next to in an airplane 
or somebody who visits your company or somebody who you just happen to strike a conversation with while you're in line in the theater. And those little moments can be moments of inspiration for you, right? And that's something that if you try to put that into standard run-of-the-mill machine learning, it would blow up because it doesn't, that ability to remember specific experiences that happened once at a place in time, which is called episodic memory. Actually, the design that you have to do to do that goes against the design features that you'd want to be able to just build up a knowledge of everything, which would be what we call semantic memory. So humans have different brain systems that do both of those things. And so in that way, humans, again, are much more agile and we're able to stop on a dime. And, you know, so like if you walk into your favorite restaurant, and you find out one day you have a terrible meal and you find out that the management has changed, you don't have to go back to that restaurant ever again. You won't have to unlearn all of those previous good experiences you had, right? Likewise, if you have an employee and you discover one day that they've been, uh, they stole some money from the company, you got that one experience that you can look at and weigh very highly. And you don't have to weigh that against all these other experiences where you didn't know they were stealing, right? So again, that allows us to stop on a dime and turn very quickly. And so I think that's a real advantage of the human brain. And, uh, and it relates to our lived experiences, which are very unique. If we could elaborate on this in terms of how we can use it in practical ways. Yeah. So in terms of our lived experiences, right, we have this ability to take, as I said, these singular experiences we have and be able to learn from them, right? And I think that the best way to learn, especially in a way that's different from a machine, is to seek out a diverse range of experiences. So uh, as I write in my book, if you look at people, for instance, who are exceptionally creative, whether it's like Picasso or Akira Kurosawa, the filmmaker, or um, the Wu-Tang Clan, the rappers, you know, they all took information and, and inspiration from a diverse range of sources that were based on their diverse range of experiences, right? So... Uh, if you make friends with people who come from very, very different backgrounds, if you learn about things that are outside of your traditional comfort zone of interest, if you read things that don't go along with your beliefs, all of those little bits, those little experiences can be sources of inspiration that allow you to be more creative and allow you to be more dynamic. And be able to come up with something unique that only you can come up with. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And again, you know, I think this is something that people really underestimate is that if you're just reading and talking to exactly the same people and going to the same places and uh, consuming the same media as everyone who you're interacting with, then you're basically interchangeable with any of those people, right? You're not going to be exposed to anything new and interesting. And if you think about it, like just uh, not to harp on ChatGPT, because it does many things better than we can do. But if you look at like ChatGPT, it's trained on the entire internet, probably. And the internet is, yes, there is a diverse range of content on the internet, but most of it comes from a pretty narrow range of sources, right? And so, and plus, you know, ChatGPT has never gone anywhere. It's never physically interacted with the world, right? So... For me, like travel is a really great source of inspiration because it forces me to see how other people live and it forces me to understand different cultures. And that is a great source of inspiration for me. Um, and uh, but it doesn't have to be that. But I think it's like the more people can do to diversify. I always like to say diversify your training data, because essentially that's something that we can do. And we can learn more from each of those experiences we have than like a big machine can. Continuing speaking about technology and its impact on our life, it seems that our memories are now being in a way impoverished because of smartphones and we're constantly making photos and we think, oh, we don't need to pay attention. I will just put the record and then pay attention to this sunset. I'm going to record it. So then forever I'm going to have this. But then in our memory, we have just this little pieces and mm -hmm. Our oh, memories are impoverished. Let's talk about why this happens and how to avoid this. That's right. I like to say that 
it's not that technology is bad. Um, it's the way we interact with technology that can be problematic. And what I mean by that is actually a number of things, but I can focus on on the question of impoverished memories. So one thing is, is that just right off the bat, we create problems for ourselves because we allow our devices to interrupt us constantly, or we get into habits where we're constantly checking our devices. And I, I'm no saint here. I'm really, I'm as much of a problem as anyone. So I will be um, at a conference and I'll often habitually check email during a conference, right? And then I walk away from the conference and I say, you know, I don't remember half these talks that I've seen. And the reason is, is that I'm shifting my attention from the talk to email, email to the talk, sometimes text messaging in between. And all of these factors actually are taking me away from the one thing that, I, that I'm hoping to remember. And yes, obviously being distracted is not good, but I mean, here's why it's so bad. Because to form a memory that really sticks around, you want it to stand out from all the other experiences that you have, right? So in other words, if I have on a clutter desk, maybe like the one I'm standing in front of now, um, if I just papered my desk with yellow post-it notes, and on one of those post-it notes, I had the password to my email account and I needed to find it, I would have a really hard time because they all look alike. And I'd have to look through all of these notes to find it. But if I had written my password on a bright green or a bright pink post-it note, it would st pop right out and I'd be able to find it. And so I say memories are kind of like that in the sense that if you form a memory that captures the sights and the sounds and you think meaningfully about what the person is saying and you relate it to things that you understand, you're going to have a very vivid memory for that talk, right? Um, and what I find is, is that when you switch from one thing to another, what happens is, is that there's an area of the brain called the prefrontal cortex, which is one that I'm really interested in. And this area of the brain allows you to use your goals to focus your attention on what's important. But what happens is, is that every time you switch from one thing to another, now your prefrontal cortex has to shift resources just to get you caught up on what you're supposed to be doing at a moment. So you don't have this ability to completely flip from one task to another without a cost. So if I flip to email, it's going to take me a little bit of time just to get back on what I'm supposed to do when I check email. And when I flip back to paying attention to this academic talk, I've got to start paying attention to that. And that takes a little bit of a moment. So we are distracted and we're not really paying attention in the first place. But then on top of it, we're also behind because every time we switch, we're inducing this cost. And so we're behind where the speaker is or it's going to take me longer to do um, email. So what I say is, is that it's like multitasking isn't really giving you any benefits. And I know many, many of your listeners probably hear messages from you know people in the tech world, for instance, saying multitasking is great. I'm so efficient. And it's like the answer is no, you're not. It's really doing two things badly at the same time. Uh, I'm sure if you have a personal assistant, you can make up for that. But <laughs> many of us don't have that luxury. Very true. And even if you have personal assistant, you can get so much more done if you don't lose time. Very interesting thing that I observed, and I don't hear people talking about it, but I'm also not in that space. So you probably know all about this. So I want to ask you. I noticed that when people are watching something and they're really paying attention, they really want to grasp, let's say it's a lecture, they're really paying attention, they want to grasp everything. As soon as brain starts processing something and kind of maybe you think of something for a second, you miss chunks, even though you are paying attention. So on top of, even if you are not getting distracted, you are still missing chunks. Mm -hmm. Imagine how much you're missing if you are distracted. Can you talk a little about this and the, how we can maybe control it better? Yes. So um, I think that this is exactly right, that even when you're trying to focus, um, you'll find that you can get distracted just by thinking about the plans that we have. And you can think you could, or like thinking about things that you're worrying about, bills that you have to pay. And so we can distract ourselves with these things too. Um, 
it's really hard to avoid this. In fact, actually, we don't quite know why attention is so limited in that way that you can only hold on to a task, for instance, that you're trying to do for so long before you start to burn out. But one thing I advise, and I'm, you know, I'm not a specialist in attention research per se, but I think one thing I advise as far as memory goes is to block off your tasks. You know, if you need to plan your day, block off some time for planning. If you need to deal with email, block off time for email. And so it's not a matter of, you know, you you can certainly check email and you can certainly check text messages and watch, you know, have conversations. You can do it all. Just block off that time so that you have one continuous stretch. Uh, because one of the other things that I didn't mention too is that when we uh, when we are shifting from one thing to another, our brain actually divides up our experience into these little discrete events. And so what happens is rather than having one kind of set of connected events for, let's say, our conversation, if I were allowing myself to get distracted by all these things around me, what happens is I end up with a lot of these little bits of memory every time I switch back and forth. And so that creates a lot of junk, a lot of clutter, as opposed to having one very rich memory, right? So um, it's very hard to avoid in this day and age. I don't want to underestimate it, you know, and I think it's like, unfortunately, we compounded by not getting enough sleep, being, you know, uh, not giving ourselves breaks. I think breaks are exceptionally important uh, because you just, I've started to actually, now that I've been doing more interviews in advance of this book, I've scheduled a 15 minute break after each one so that I have some downtime and I just allow myself to, I allow my mind to wander. And if you give yourself that time to allow your mind to wander, then you can come back and then you can focus and pay attention better. And I think when you're doing interviews, you may even need 30 minutes because you're <laughs> speaking the entire hour. If you're the one who is being interviewed, that's a tough job to have. Yeah, it's an enviable task, though. I don't mind having that problem. But yes, it's, uh, yeah, maybe 30 minutes. You're right. It, it does take a while to recover. Charan, so can you give us some advice on how we can rest better? What is the recommended amount of time throughout the day? How often? How long? I don't have a particular number. But what I will say, this is a fascinating area that people are still starting to understand, is that we tend to think of downtime as being like wasted time. But one of the fascinating things is, is that we know this happens during sleep, for instance, that areas in the brain that are important for memory actually come alive during sleep. And they talk to each other in different ways during different stages of sleep. So we know that the stages, the deepest sleep are actually very important for memory. And somehow deep sleep plus REM sleep, which is what happens when we're dreaming, um, come together to allow you to take the experiences that you recently have and start finding connections in between across these different experiences, or at least that's one theory. And so according to this theory, basically you can experience many, many little things. And after sleep, your brain can discover those connections and put it together into some kind of knowledge and wisdom that you might not have had before. And so, you know, anecdotally, and this is a controversial idea, but anecdotally, people will report waking up and they just have a solution to a problem that bugged them the day before, right? Um, I think Paul McCartney reported like waking up and he had this song. I can't remember which one it was. <laughs> Ironic, right? But um, he woke up and he just had all the chords in his head for this one song. And that's kind of an example of how sleep can be very important for our daily thinking. Uh, naps can also be very powerful, too. Uh, and one of the things that some people have found, we've found this in my lab, is that even during um, uh, even during states of rest, uh, Leila Devachi's lab was the first to do this, but even during states of rest, the brain can replay recent experiences and reactivate them in ways that allow you potentially to remember them more. So even just closing your eyes and zoning out, what happens is the brain doesn't stop. It just starts bubbling up all these you know, memories and thoughts and ideas in ways that can be recombined. So I don't have a recommendation on how much a person needs. I don't 
think that we even have data to show for sure. But what I would say is, is that if you feel like you need it, that's probably a good time to take a break, you know? And I think a lot of people sometimes don't trust themselves enough to actually just follow their instincts. That is very true. And then in terms of the type of rest that would be good for our brain, so other than sleep, so when we are awake, what type of rest is most beneficial? Exercise is definitely one. And I know people don't think of exercise as rest, but at the same time, we know that like many people, after they exercise, they feel very refreshed in the sense of like, they feel like de-stressed. And in fact, exercise reduces stress. In the long term, exercise has been shown in many, many studies to improve memory. We think one of the reasons is it's improving blood flow to the brain. And so, and that impacts especially this area I mentioned, the prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex, its functioning improves over, you know, uh, over like after people have exercised many times. And it also improves, you know, also exercises reducing the impact of stress on the brain and the body. Uh, so that's another benefit. It improves sleep, which as we've talked about is very important. So it's really a great thing to do. It's, it's an investment. And I have to admit, I have had a hard time working in exercise into my schedule. And after writing the book, I said, I'm just going to make this, I'm just going to carve that time out. And it's been great for me. It really has. Sharon, and other than exercise, what are some recommended and not recommended types of rest? Yeah, I guess what I would say is that uh, another thing that I would recommend just in general is to uh, change context. So what I mean by this is our memories for events, episodic memories, which is what I study, are tied to a particular place in time, right? And so you probably had this experience of you go like you go back home to see your childhood home or something. And all of a sudden these memories come into your head that seemed locked away. You didn't know you even had them, right? Or if you smell something or if you hear a song, it brings you back to a time and place, right? So those are these very unique memories. Uh, and at the same time, what we saw during the pandemic was people had very blurry memories of what was going on, right? And the reason I believe, and, and some research backs this up, is that people weren't changing their context. You were doing this, sitting in front of a screen, typing, mostly interacting with the same people in the same place without any kind of, you know, break. And so I actually was teaching a class uh, at that time, uh, you know, first class I taught after the pandemic. And I just decided, you know, we're doing this on Zoom. And so to keep the students engaged, we would sometimes do polls. And so one day I just decided to ask them, hey, do you feel like time has been moving more quickly or more slowly or about the same during the pandemic? And actually, let me ask you, what's your, how was it for you, Chris? For me, it was kind of the same. It was the same. Okay. Yes, because I work a lot. So okay. I spend a lot of time in front of my computer, regardless of whether there is pandemic or not. Oh, okay. Well, maybe you'll change after hearing this. But um, for a lot of people, 95% uh, of the students in their class said that the lockdowns actually made it seem like the days were going on forever. So then I said, okay, do you feel like the weeks are passing by more slowly or more quickly or about the same? And about 85% of them said, no, it's been moving faster. The weeks kind of disappear from me, right? And so what they were really saying, in my opinion, is that essentially the, the days seem to go by very quickly, or I mean, very slowly, because they were in the same place doing the same thing. And so they didn't have these kind of distinctive events for different experiences. It just felt like one long blur to them, right? But then at the end of the week, you ask people, well, what happened in the week? And people look back and they don't remember anything because it was all just filled with all this blurry sameness, right? So changing up your context can help give you that sense that you've got more distinctive memories as a result. And so you can look back on your week and be like, ah, I remember what happened. So I think that's a very important thing. And you can combine this too. Sometimes I do this where I do walking meetings 
I don't know if any of your listeners do this, but um, sometimes I like to do meetings where I'm walking out in nature because we have a, our backyard is right by this creek. Uh, and so we'll walk behind the house uh, on this path. And so when I walk my dog, sometimes I'll do meetings, sometimes I don't. But being out in nature has been shown to have good effects on thinking and memory too. And so that one, that way I'm getting exercise and I'm uh, out in nature. And sometimes even if I do meetings during that, I actually find I think much better during these walking meetings on the phone than I do if I'm actually sitting down in front of my computer. Now, it might not work for everybody. Sometimes it's distracting, but I, I find it to be very helpful. I use walking meetings while in nature all the time. Highly recommend. So pleasant. You get exercise, you spend time in nature. And also, I'm glad that sometimes you're spending time in nature without meetings because it's also important to just connect with nature. It's so interesting you're speaking about it because I was thinking over the last few years, I was trying to understand why as we're getting older, it seems that time is going faster. And I was thinking that one of the key reasons for that is we have too much of the sameness as we're getting older. We don't have enough variety, enough exciting moments happening, and everything just blurs together and flies by. I think that makes sense. Yeah, I think so too. Um, also, just as an aside, uh, episodic memory does go down a little as we get older, you know, so it's very natural for older people to forget. Um, you're probably way younger than me, so you're not experiencing the worst of it yet. But uh, uh, but for many people, as you get older, memory gets worse. And so what happens, again, like you said, is you look back on the last year, and it seems like you can't remember what happened. And so you get this kind of this extra sense of like time slipping by. So it's not necessarily moving faster, but in fact, what we're perceiving is really just a lack of memories for that time that was there. And so it seems like that time just disappeared on you. Right. Um, and it's almost like, I mean, if you wanted to take the most extreme example, like people who have, let's say brain damage and they have a memory disorder, what will sometimes happen is, is that their sense of where they are in time is stuck to the point when they had brain damage because they're not forming new memories afterwards. And so you could, if a patient, you know, had brain damage in the 1960s, to them, every day might feel like they were in the 1960s. Um, and so sometimes that that can contribute as well. If we're just having a natural reduction in our ability to form memories, then that's going to give us a sense that time is slipping by. Sharon, let's talk about how can we improve our ability to remember something, especially the type of things we really want to remember. I know that some of the things you recommend is using attention and intention. That's right. That's right. So one of the things that I talk about in the book is this idea that we're always paying attention to something. And so sometimes we say, oh, I wasn't paying attention. But what they mean is I wasn't paying attention to what I should be paying attention to because our attention is always being grabbed by things around us. And that grabbing of our attention, again, it just has this cost because we're switching back and forth between all these different things. And so that, and also it keeps us from focusing on what we want. So for instance, uh, just take the example of, and again, I can look to my own life for this, you know, losing keys or losing your phone or my glasses. And what happens is, is that, I'm not, it's not that I'm thinking intentionally about putting my glasses somewhere. And so as a result, I'm taking my glasses off and I'm thinking about things that happened in the past at work. I'm, I'm engrossed in this world of memory. I'm thinking about things that happen at work or I'm thinking about tasks that I have to do at home. I'm planning what I'm going to make for dinner. And all that are different ways in which memory captures your attention, for instance. Or... I'm being, my attention's being shifted over to the dog and shifted over to, you know, uh, um, just different things that could be happening, the TV set or something. So all of those things will capture our attention. And so you need to be able to learn with intention to focus on what's important at those moments that are important. Uh, but it's hard. I think it's like the best thing I can tell people is don't surround yourself with distractions. 
you know, obviously a new parent is not going to be able to, you know, you have to be around your child and your child starts crying. That's the first thing you have to attend to, right? But how many people are like listening to their earbuds, listening to music or something or listening to podcasts? No offense. I mean, podcasts are good. But while they're doing other things where they should be, you know, that where they should be attending and, and focusing. Um, and that's going to be something that costs you or, uh, yeah, just all sorts of things that we do to distract ourselves and and impede our ability to stay in the present. Because that's the thing. There's this trade-off between being in the world of memory and being in the present time. And sometimes being in the world of memory can take away from what's going on in the moment. And that's not what you want. You know, there's a time to remember, and then there's a time to be in the moment. When we speak about multitasking, we are usually speaking about how much time you lose, that it is not very effective, but we don't talk enough about the overloading of the brain that is happening because your brain has to work harder because it still has to do a good job, relatively good job with both tasks. So if you are listening to a podcast and trying to answer your emails, your brain needs to be able to, in parallel, pay attention to both. Yes, there's a limited amount of information that you can keep in mind at a given time, right? So in other words, you can keep in mind one phone number and you can keep that in your head. But now if I give you 10 phone numbers, you won't be able to keep them all in your head. It's just very hard. So that is characteristic of this limited capacity we have. But the problem is, is that every time we switch back and forth from one thing to another, we end up dumping what's in that working memory, so to speak, what's dumping what's on our mind and shifting to this new thing. And then we have to reload working memory again when we switch back. So that is a cost, actually, something I don't think I hadn't talked about much. But yes, that's that can be a real problem, too. Uh, you know, another thing I'll say, too, is uh, this speaks to something you brought up earlier, which is documentation. And one of the things that I think people, one of the mistakes people make with technology is they try to document everything. And again, it's this matter of quality versus quantity. So if you're trying to document everything, like, you know, having, watching a concert and just recording the whole thing on your phone, or, you know, you have like uh, your child's birthday party, you're just trying to record everything that's going on. What happens is, you're not really focusing your attention on anything because you're constantly shifting all around to try to capture everything. And so what happens is, is that, yes, you might have a record in your phone of what happened in terms of like all the video footage you have. Um, but at the same time, you don't have a vivid memory for it because you've just been trying to move around all over the place. And on the other hand, there's research that, so the research shows that in fact, in many, many cases, taking pictures of things actually can reduce your memory. Um, and on the other hand, if you're very intentional about photography, so you don't try to capture everything, but you try to capture just the moments that are important to you in some way, that can actually enhance your memory. So, and this kind of comes back in another way that's very interesting too, which is if you take a, a you know a thousand videos or pictures of you know a particular event, you're just going to have a bunch of cluttered memories, so to speak, on your computer. How many of these are you actually going to revisit later on? Probably none of them, unless Facebook reminds you of them or something. You're not going to revisit those. But on the other hand. If you take a few pictures that are very strategic or a few videos at times that you really are just like where you're focused on one particular thing that you want to think about documenting, now you probably would go back to, you're more likely to go back to those um, events. And what is helpful is those are going to be effective reminders for the event that you experience. And just that act of going back and revisiting those cues and thinking about them helps you strengthen that memory in your mind. So um, if you're careful about what you document, you can actually get more. I mean, again, one of the things that I go back to all the time in memory is like less is more. And if you think about it, let's say it is some important event and you're paying attention to recording it, you're missing on so many things. For example, the breeze passing by, all the part of the memory that you could have had if you paid attention to that moment. 
That's correct. And uh, that's part of what gives us that vivid memory is the sense of touch, the sense of smell, the, you know, what we're seeing and that all what we're feeling emotionally. And that all is going to give you a memory that's much more rich than something that you could just imagine. Right. So in other words, if I read a book about going to the beach versus I actually go to the beach, in some sense, there's a lot of commonality between the two. I could read a story of somebody who go to the beach, went to the beach, or I could live out that experience myself at the beach. And to your brain, the main difference would be that actual physical sensations of being at the beach and, and seeing things and feeling things and hearing things. Uh, and in fact, otherwise, what happens is we often get mixed up. It's often very hard to tell the difference between things that we just thought about or imagined versus things that actually happen. Um, I have this all the time, for instance, when because I, I have to take some medications in the morning. And sometimes I find myself asking, wait, did I take the medication or did I just think about it? And so I have to go back and visually imagine where was I in the morning? What was I thinking about? And put myself mentally back at that time. And then I can figure it out. But if you don't allow yourself those experiences and you're not paying attention to them, then what's going to happen is, is that you'll never really have a rich memory in the first place. And it'll be just like something that you read about in a book. And we're probably also missing on opportunities to grow as a person because we're not experiencing what we're supposed to experience as part of life. We are recording so many things and we're not experiencing so many things. And now children are doing it from very young age. Yeah, I imagine that's true. I, what I would say is, is that um, sometimes what we our beliefs and our knowledge can overwhelm our ability to learn, meaning that essentially... Like, I'll just give you another example from my own life, which is people often say, oh, scientists should be doing innovative work, or I'm sure in the business world, it's the same innovation, innovation, innovation. But when you truly do something innovative, what I find, at least in science, is half the people in the room will say, oh, I already knew that. Or, and the other half will say, oh, this is obviously wrong. You know, And so often our beliefs will actually blind us to what's new and what's interesting in the world. And so that that's, uh, I think, a big maybe relates to what you're talking about, is that part of our learning is being able to see what is different and to see the changes. Because one of the things we know is that um, not everything is going to be remembered, but we tend to remember things that don't fit with what we already knew things that are surprising in some way, things that are novel. And so if you're not looking for those things, if you're not looking for the surprise, if you're not looking for what's novel, you're never going to, you're not going to learn from it, right? That is very true. I think this is an attitude problem that we sometimes have about memory is that we think memory is supposed to be easy. Memory should be effortless. And that if it feels like a little bit of effort is going into it, that's somehow a bad thing. Um, but, you know, often paying attention to what's new is not comfortable. It's not necessarily, it's not comfortable to know, to, to be made aware of the fact that you're not, that you don't know everything, right? But you can translate that feeling of discomfort into curiosity, and one of the things that we've shown in my lab is that being in a state of curiosity, being motivated to find information, even though it can be uncomfortable, can actually dramatically or can actually enhance memory, even for things that are not relevant to what you're searching for. And the reason is, is that it seems to put the brain in a state, uh, releases certain chemicals in the brain like dopamine that may be important for learning. I think it could be connected to emotions. You're experiencing an emotion. You're curious versus just neutral. And it makes you pay attention. It makes you remember that moment more and then you retain more. That's right. Yeah, I think that's right. Another very interesting thing about memory is how easy it is to distort it. Mm -hmm. I know we don't have much time left, but let's cover it a little bit because I think people need to understand how careful they need to be with their own memory and how other people's memories can be distorted relatively easy. 
Yes, that's right. So one of the things, and, and you know, I think many of your listeners can probably relate to this. You probably have relatives, for instance, who tell all these stories about your childhood or something, and you remember it very, very differently. So sometimes brothers and sisters have this thing where siblings will have grown up together. They experienced exactly the same thing, and but the stories are different. And the reason is, again, we're not replaying the past, and we don't even have access to everything that's happening. And so what happens is when we remember, we pull up all of these fragments, these little pieces of what happened, but our brain gets to work immediately on making a story out of it. And so when we make the story out of it, we infuse those little bits of episodic memory with, it, and we fill in the blanks, we fill in the gaps with information that we know, with our knowledge about the world and our beliefs about the world and our perspective. And so sometimes what happens is we fill in so many gaps that we actually remember things that didn't happen. Now, most of the time, people are pretty good about being um, accurate with memory. But sometimes, especially if you're stressed out, if you're tired, all of these things that affect the prefrontal cortex badly um, will make it harder to be able to uh, be accurate with your memory. Uh, what makes things even worse is retrieving a memory, recalling something, actually can lead a memory to be changed. And as a result, what happens is, is that sometimes memories can be corrupted, where you get some wrong information, and then that actually will corrupt your memory for what happened. And so, for instance, you can see this work very intensely in groups, where if somebody gives some misinformation in a group that's trying to remember something, what happens is, is that misinformation gets infused into the collective memory of what happened. So for instance, if you had a group that was like meeting regularly and one of them misremembers some fact about the previous meeting, now the next time everyone could misremember that same information. So those are real problems. Um, the things that we can do to help that is that we can, Again, you know, all the things that help with just remembering period will help you keep memory accurate too. So for instance, if we're more tired, we're overwhelmed, we're multitasking, all those things actually can make us more susceptible to misinformation, susceptible to false memories even. I think one area where this is kind of very dangerous is when, for example, someone criticizes us about something and then they start exaggerating. When people get emotional, they start exaggerating. And then they start saying things that did not necessarily happen. But then you may start believing those things. And then it will impact your belief in yourself. Let's say, for example, you did a presentation and you did not do amazingly well. But then the way the other person described it to you, as if you were the worst presenter who have ever stepped on stage. And so then you can start believing in it and it can really damage your confidence and your belief that you can be great at it. That's exactly right. It can be once people give you feedback about something that you've done, that can change your memory about how that happened, right? So you can take, I used to see this when I was doing uh, therapy during my clinical training and I would work in therapy contexts with patients. And one of the things that we used to do would be to try to undo the damage that you're talking about, because people would often remember these events from their past in a very kind of, in a, through a filter that emphasized the negative things, emphasized the mistakes, emphasized the ways in which people treated them badly or things they felt guilty about. And one of the things that we would do would be to encourage people to change their perspective and to look at the event differently. And so that was a positive way we could actually take the same experiences and make them into something that's more positive. Because one of the things that's been shown both experimentally, and I could see this in the clinic, is people do have the ability to look at the past from different perspectives. And when they do, you can often remember things that didn't easily come to mind before, right? So if you're angry at somebody, you can remember all of these terrible things about them. But then when you're getting along really well with them, you probably have a lot of trouble remembering all those reasons that you were angry in the first place. I think we've all had this 
where you get into a fight with someone you're close to and later on you can't even remember what you fought about right <laughs> and so so that's kind of an example of how when we're consulting memory our moods our feelings in the present are going to filter those stories that we put together about the past so when we remember even though it happened in the past the story we put together is very much in the present moment i want to make sure that you have proper 15 minutes before your next interview so let's wrap up such an amazing discussion where can our listeners can learn more about your work find your book anything you want to share oh excellent well you can keep up with me on instagram i have an account called the memory doc and uh, you can also go to my website and I'm, I think I'm putting, I have a link for a mailing list that I'll hopefully start doing. Uh, but also I would really encourage people if you're interested to check out my book, Why We Remember. It's coming out in the US and in many other countries on February 20th and in the UK uh, by Faber and Faber um, on March 14th, I believe. Thank you, Charan. Such a pleasure to have this discussion with you. Thank you for doing the work that you are doing. We need to understand more about how memory works and how we can leverage it better. For everyone watching or listening, our guests have been today, again, Dr. Charan Ranganath. The last name is R-A-N-G-A-N-A-T-H. First name is C-H-A-R-A-N. And you can find Charan's book, probably in any places where books are sold after the release date, it is called, again, Why We Remember. And our podcast sponsor today is strategytraining.com. If you want to strengthen your strategy skills, you can get the overall approach used in well-managed strategy studies, and you can get it on termsconsulting.com forward slash overall approach. Charan, thank you again very much for being here. Thank you very much, Chris. It was great. I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you again, everyone, for tuning in, and I'm looking forward to connect with you all next time.